Hey everyone, welcome back to DSP Lectures. In the last lecture, we learned about normalized frequency. Continuing from there, we are going to learn about aliasing and sampling theorem in this video. So, let's get started. Before going into our main topic, let's just review the notion of frequency for continuous time signals. Here is a continuous time signal. The x-axis here has unit in seconds. You can also see that the signal completes one cycle in one second. So, the frequency of continuous time sinusoid is f equal to one cycle per second or in other words equal to one hertz. Now, consider this new signal. Here, the signal completes two cycles in one second. So, the frequency is f equal to two cycles per second or equal to two hertz. We can go in the opposite direction also. That is, if the signal takes two seconds to complete one cycle, or in other words, if the signal completes half the cycle in one second, then the frequency is f equal to one half hertz. Coming to the extreme end, if the signal is not varying repeatedly with time, then it has a frequency of 0 Hz and this is the lowest frequency possible in a continuous time signal. On the other end, we can have signals with frequencies 4 Hz, 8 Hz, 16 Hz or 32 Hz and so on. This means that there is no limit on the highest frequency that a continuous time signal could have. It can extend all the way to infinity. So, let's write that down. The range of frequency possible for continuous time signals is from 0 to infinity. Right? Um, not really. The actual possible range is from minus infinity to plus infinity. Okay, so what does negative frequency even mean? To explain that, just the time domain is not enough. Let's take the spinning wheel analogy for that. Here, when the wheel completes one cycle, we get one cycle of sine wave. So, if the wheel completes one rotation in one second, we get a frequency of one hertz. If it completes two cycles in a second, the frequency is two hertz and so on. By convention, the rotation of wheel in anti-clockwise direction is considered positive and thus, we get frequencies in the range from 0 to infinity. Similarly, in this analogy, if the wheel is spinning in the clockwise direction, then it corresponds to negative frequencies. For example, if the wheel spins in clockwise direction, completing one cycle in one second, it corresponds to a frequency of f equal to minus 1 hertz. The point to emphasize here is, a continuous time signal could have any frequency in the range of minus infinity to plus infinity. But this is not the case with discrete time signals. Before going any further, let's recap our definition of normalized frequency of a discrete time signal. The normalized frequency of a discrete time signal obtained from a continuous time signal is defined as the frequency of the original continuous time signal normalized by the sampling frequency at which the original signal is sampled. I have explained this in detail in the last video. For those who are unfamiliar with the topic, the link to that video is given in the video descriptions below. So, coming back, here is a continuous time cosine signal with a frequency of 2 Hz. Let's sample it at a rate of 8 times per second or in other words with a sampling frequency of 8 Hz. So, the normalized frequency of resulting discrete time signal will be 2 Hz divided by 8 Hz that is 2 by 8 or 1 by 4 and we can see that we get 4 samples per cycle of the discrete time signal. Now, consider another continuous time cosine signal with a frequency of 1 Hz. Let us again sample this with a sampling frequency of 8 Hz. So, the normalized frequency will be f equal to 1 by 8. 
This means that it takes 8 samples to complete one cycle of the discrete time signal. Now let us try sampling the same signal with a sampling frequency of 2 Hz. Here the normalized frequency is 1 half. That is, it takes 2 samples to complete one cycle of the discrete time signal. If the same 1 Hz continuous time signal is sampled with a sampling frequency of 1 Hz, then the normalized frequency will be 1. So, it takes just one sample to complete one cycle of the discrete time signal. Now, consider a continuous time signal with a frequency of 0 Hz. Let us sample this signal at a sampling rate of 1 Hz. Therefore, the normalized frequency here is 0 by 1 which is 0. But if you look, these two discrete time signals are the same. So, what separates both of them? The answer is nothing really. Therefore, we should instead ask what can we do about it. We can choose to say that a discrete time signal cannot have frequencies larger than one half. So, the range of frequencies possible for discrete time signals are 0 less than or equal to f less than or equal to half. Um, well, to be precise, minus half less than f less than or equal to half considering our spinning wheel analogy we saw earlier. So, let me state it once again. The range of frequency for discrete time signals is minus half less than f less than or equal to half. This is an important result that distinguishes a discrete time signal from a continuous time signal as continuous time signals can have frequencies in the range of minus infinity to plus infinity. Also, note that the highest rate of oscillation in a discrete time sinusoid is obtained when f is equal to one half. This is very evident if you check the discrete time signals we have discussed so far. Okay, now let us study another interesting phenomenon of a discrete time signal. Consider a continuous time sinusoid with a frequency of 4 Hz. If we sample this signal at a sampling rate of 4 Hz, then the normalized frequency of the resulting discrete time signal will be f equal to 4 by 4 equal to 1. But if you think about it, these yellow samples can also constitute a discrete time signal with a normalized frequency of 0, right? So let us generalize this concept. Any two normalized frequencies that differ by an integer will result in the same discrete time signals. Let us take an example to validate this concept. Consider a continuous time signal with a frequency of 1 Hz and sample this signal at a sampling rate of 2 Hz. The resultant discrete time signal will have a normalized frequency of f equal to 1 by 2. Now if we add 1 to this normalized frequency, we will get a new normalized frequency f dash equal to f plus 1 which is 1 half plus 1 and this is equal to 3 by 2. By the equation we saw earlier, the discrete time signal with normalized frequency 1 half should be the same as the discrete time signal with normalized frequency 3 by 2. And that is exactly what we get. So, the equivalence of normalized frequency 1 half and the normalized frequency 3 by 2 means that the continuous time signals with frequency 1 hertz and 3 hertz will result in the same discrete time signal when sampled at a frequency of 2 hertz. This phenomenon is called aliasing. Earlier, we saw that the normalized frequencies of 1 and 0 yield the same discrete time signal. This was due to aliasing effect. Now, we will see why aliasing effect occurs using our spinning wheel analogy. Consider these three wheels. Let these three arrow marks represent the 0 degree. Also, the first wheel rotates at an angular speed of 30 degree per second the second wheel with a speed of 390 degree per second and the third wheel with a speed of minus 330 degree per second. That is, this wheel rotates in the clockwise direction at a rate of 330 degree per second. 
Now let us make discrete time plots for each of these three cases where the y axis is the degree of this line with respect to the 0 degree mark. Let us fix the sampling period as t equal to 1 second that is we plot the degrees at intervals of 1 second. You can see that even though the degree of rotation is different all three cases yield the same discrete time plot. I hope now you can see why aliasing occurs when the normalized frequencies differ by integer amounts. Aliasing occurs because we simply cannot observe the number of integer rotation between the samples. One way to solve this problem is by sampling at a rate faster than the frequency of rotation. But how far should we go? This question is answered by the sampling theorem. The sampling theorem states that the sampling frequency should be greater than or equal to twice the highest frequency component of the input signal to get distortionless output signal. Any sampling frequency less than twice the input signal frequency will result in aliasing effect. Ok now there is another term you might want to know. Nyquist rate. It is simply the sampling rate which is equal to twice the input signal frequency. And this condition is called Nyquist criteria for sampling. Ok, so we learned that to prevent aliasing, Fs should be greater than or equal to 2 times F max. This max becomes important when we are dealing with signals which is a superposition of many signals. For example, suppose our signal to be sampled is x of t equal to cos of 2 pi into 100 t plus cos of 2 pi into 200 t. In this case, f max is equal to 200 hertz. Therefore, to prevent aliasing, the sampling rate fs should be greater than or equal to 2 times 200 hertz. That is, fs should be greater than or equal to 400 hertz. Okay. Anyways, on another note, we could reach the same inequality from our limits on the possible range for normalized frequency. We learned that minus half less than f less than or equal to plus half. But we know that the normalized frequency small f is equal to capital F which is the frequency of continuous time signal divided by capital F s which is the sampling frequency. Therefore, this becomes minus half less than f by fs less than or equal to plus half or minus fs less than twice f less than or equal to fs. If you see, this is the inequality defined in the sampling theorem, right? Okay, so that's all for this lecture. To summarize what all we learned in this lecture, we learned the relationship between continuous time signal and discrete time signal and the range of frequencies possible for each of them. We also studied the aliasing effect and the sampling theorem. In the next video, we will see some solved examples related to this topic. I hope that all the concepts that were taught in this lecture are clear to all of you. If you have any doubts, feel free to ask them in the comments. Either we or some other viewer will surely help you. Also, if you found this lecture useful, please like the video and support us by subscribing to the channel. Thank you for watching Topperly and have a great day.